Peace be upon you. If you had to contrast structures developed by human beings compared to what you find in nature, there's a very distinct difference between the two. But if you had to sum it up to what that difference was, it gets a little convoluted. For instance, you take a garden planted by human beings, and what you realize is that all the plants, they're grouped into a certain organization, uh, things are in rows and columns, and it's very structured, it's very orderly. And you contrast that to what you see in nature, is say you're going for a hike, and you realize that there's no real rhyme or reason to where the uh, plants grow, um, the order of things, what plants are growing. You know, these things seem disorderly chaotic. Or you take a, a skyscraper, and you see that it's in its designated plot of land. Uh, it's fully uh, upright uh, in straight lines, in rectangular shapes. And you contrast that to a termite mound that can go, you know, 10 feet up. And... Uh, it doesn't have a specific shape to it. Uh, it doesn't have very, you know, uh, accurate lines. And it seems, again, disorderly chaotic, but there is an element of design there. Or you compare a road constructed by human beings. And what you see that these go in complete straight lines, uh, 90 degree right turns. And it's, again, very orderly. It's systematic. Um, and there's this element of human touch to it. And you contrast that to rivers where they go in any which way, they go the, the path of least resistance, and um, it seems, again, disorderly, kind of chaotic, but there's a distinct pattern to it. What would you call that pattern? We're going to look at one other comparison. You take a human being who created a building, and what you see is distinct geometric shapes. You see triangles, rectangles, straight lines, you know, foundation, things that, again, are orderly, systematic, um, very easy to identify, and you contrast that to a mountaintop. You know, mountaintop seems like there's no real rhyme or reason to where one pattern starts and another one ends and the overall construct. But what would you call a shape of a mountain? To call it just sheerly a triangle wouldn't be an accurate representation. And this was a problem in 1978. There was an engineer working at Boeing and he wanted to create flight simulation software that looked like real life. He wanted the landscape to look like what you would see if you were to stare out of a plane. And he wasn't able to do this with just simple geometric shapes. And the challenge he ran into was he thought that in order to get this done, either he would need massive amounts of computing power, or he would need thousands of animators to uh, draw each individual frame in order to create this real life experience. And either way, it wasn't a feasible. So he said, okay, it's a problem that he can't solve until he stumbled upon a book written by Benoit Manderbal. It's called Fractals Form chance and dimension. And in this book, what was described was the shape of nature. And it gives this example. You take a triangle, and on the side of each triangle, you put another triangle. And on the side of those triangles, you put another triangle. And you repeat this pattern into infinity. What you end up getting is what he calls a fractal. And it's a shape that's infinitely uh, uh, complex, but also incredibly simplistic, meaning that you could zoom in to the shape indefinitely and see the same shape and zoom out as far as you want and still see the same shape. And what makes this so fascinating is that you created an object which theoretically has an infinite parameter but a fixed volume. And when they applied this principle of fractal design to his uh, flight simulation software, he was able to create landscapes that look like they do in real life, mountaintops that look realistic, riverbeds that look like you would see it. Because in nature, the design that this is uh, orchestrated by is called a fractal. And you take a simple shape, or quote unquote simple, like a snowflake, and you see that this has a fractal design, where you have shapes within shapes within shapes within shapes that can go in almost indefinitely. Um, and you contrast that. Now you look at the mountaintop. What do you see? You see fractals all around. You look at plants. You take something like a broccoli, cauliflower, and you see this fractal shape. You take an animal, say a nautilus or a peacock, and you see this fractal design where it seems almost infinitely complex, but it just follows a very simple pattern that's repeated indefinitely. So across all of nature, from lightning bolts to even our uh, physiology, you look at the lungs within a human being, you look at the blood vessels within a human being, and these are fractal designs. One of the interesting aspects is you take a tree. A tree has a trunk, and then the trunk has branches, and the branches has twigs, and this repeats, this pattern repeats. And what they found out was that if you took a tree inside a forest and you counted the amount of branches and twigs, this ended up being proportional to the number of trees and the density in that forest. 
So you see, within nature, there's this repeated fractal design. And until Benoit Mandrible gave it a name, people just thought of this as noise. They thought of this as messy, chaotic, disorderly, and it was because it wasn't identified to them. But once it was identified to them, it became apparent and they see it everywhere. And this is the beauty of a fractal, is that it's per God's design, that he's able to take something, a very simple pattern, repeat it indefinitely, and create this beautifully uh, elaborate uh, design out of it. Now, if God was to create a book, would you expect it to be in the shape of what a human being who wrote a book would have it, or would it be in a different design? Because when a human being writes a book or an essay or a, uh, an article, it has a beginning, a middle, an end. Or if you go to college in high school, they have you write a five-paragraph essay where you give your <laughs> thesis and the introduction, you give your three supporting arguments in each of the paragraphs, and then you have a conclusion at the end. Um, or if you want to get more elaborate, Joseph Campbell uh, identified that within uh, narratives, within myths, you have the uh, hero's journey where a hero goes on specific events within a uh, uh, journey in order to reach an end destination of personal growth. And you see this throughout all of uh, mythology and a lot of these uh, stories that have circulated through uh, generations and generations. But these, again, follow very confined, fixed kind of structures. Just like we would see when a human being builds something like a building or a road, that they do this in this very systematic, orderly, uh, simplistic way. But when God designed something in nature, you see that it's infinitely complex in the sense, but it follows this very simple pattern of a fractal. So when you look at the Quran, which is a book that's claimed to be authored by God, would you expect it to run in this very simple narrative, a beginning, a middle, and end, where you read it once and you get everything you need out of it? Or would you expect it to be written in such a way where it's designed just like God designed nature? And that's how the Quran's written. The Quran is written in a very fractal design, in the sense that there isn't a beginning, middle, and end. It's patterns within patterns within patterns within patterns that go indefinitely. Because if you read the entire Quran, you get an understanding of the Quran. But also, if you read one chapter of the Quran, one surah of the Quran, you can, if you fully understood that surah, you would see that same pattern within the entire Quran. Or if you read a single verse within the Quran, and you fully understood that verse in the Quran, you'd be able to understand or see the entire Quran. And this is what makes the Quran so beautiful. If you read the first chapter of the Quran, the key, Al-Fatiha, what you'll see is three parts within these seven verses. So the first part is defining who God is. It says, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. So we know right there that the author of this book is claiming to be most gracious, most merciful. It says, praise be to God, Lord of the universe, that God is claiming to be the Lord of the universe. And again, he's reiterating in verse three, most gracious, most merciful. So in these first three verses, we understand who God is. Then in verse four, it tells us master of the day of judgment. It's telling us that there's a day of judgment and that God is the master of the day of judgment, meaning no one else has any say on this day, be it the day of judgment. And then in verse five through seven, it says, you alone we worship, you alone we ask for help, guide us in the right path, the path of those whom you've blessed, none of those who deserve wrath, nor of the strayers. So this is us making a plea to God to keep us on the right path. And if we fully understood these seven verses and we applied these seven verses to our life, we would understand the entire Quran. We would understand everything it means to be a good submitter. But you can reduce this down to one verse. In Surah 262 or 569, it reads, Surely those who believe, those who are Jewish, the Christians, the converts, anyone who, one, believes in God. So here it tells us, believe in God. And God told us in Surah 1, verse 1 through 3, who God is. And then item number two, believes in the last day. Item number three, leads a righteous life, will receive their recompense from their Lord. They have nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. So this is the beauty of it, is the fact that you can sum down the first seven verses of the Quran down to one verse. And you see this pattern repeated again and again, where God is saying, believe in God, defining who God is. That it's in order for us to be able to make it to the hereafter, we have to believe in the day of judgment. That if we do not believe in a day of judgment, the possibility of us being redeemed is astronomically small. Uh, God knows the end destination of any person, but God is telling us this is a prerequisite in order to make it into heaven. And then the third one is to lead a righteous life, to do the things that please God, to be a moral person, 
uh, to make the decisions that are uh, acceptable to God. And God is the definition of what is good. Without God, there is everything else is just an opinion. Everything else is just relative. Uh, without God, there is no definitive standard of what is good. God is the one who sets that standard. So if we understand this, we understand the entire Quran, we can break it down to one surah, we can break it down to one verse. It shows that this pattern in the Quran isn't written by a human being. It's written the same manner that we see where God created all the nature, everything from the stars, the galaxies to the universe. We see this fractal design. And similarly, one of the criticisms people say when they read the Quran, they say this isn't written like a regular book. It doesn't have a beginning, middle, and end. It doesn't have this narrative form. It basically jumps from one section to another, one topic to another, and it's because it's written the same manner that you would see that God created the other elements in nature, because this is a book from God. Now, one of the facets of a fractal that makes it so interesting is that, theoretically, it has an infinite parameter, but a fixed volume. And the Quran operates in the same way. It has infinite deafness, meaning you can read it a million times and still be able to pull out new understandings, new meanings, new insights from it, but it has a fixed volume. In Surah 31, verse 27, it reads, If all the trees on earth were made into pens, and the ocean supplied the ink augmented by seven more oceans, the words of God would not run out. God is almighty, most wise. In Surah 18, verse 109, it reads, Say, if the oceans were ink for the words of my Lord, the ocean would run out before the words of my Lord run out, even if we doubled the ink supply. So God is telling us that his words are infinite, but he reduced it down to these 114 chapters. This is all we need for our salvation. But the depth of understanding of these 114 chapters is infinite. Meaning that if you had all the ink of all the oceans augmented by seven more oceans, and you turned all the trees into pens, you could continue writing about the depth of understanding of this book because it's infinitely depth, despite the fact that it has a fixed volume. So now that we've seen that the literary composition of the Quran has this fractal design element to it, that you can look at one verse and understand the entire Quran, or one surah, or even the entire Quran, and each time be able to pull out new insights, new understandings, based around believing who God is, understanding who God is, believing in the last day, what is the last day, and what it means to lead a righteous life, these three basic principles of the Quran. What if we look at the mathematical structure of the Quran? And what's fascinating is you find the same kind of fractal design. Now, the mathematical structure of the Quran revolves around the common denominator of the number 19. Now, simple facts around the number 19. There's 114 chapters in the Quran. This is 19 times 6. The number of verses in the Quran is 6,000. 346, which is 19 times 334, even the number 19 depicts the Alpha and the Omega, the names of God, the beginning, the last, one and the nine. So these are the reasons that the number 19 was selected. But what's really fascinating is that despite looking at it from a high level, you can zoom into specific aspects of the mathematical miracle and pull out new understandings and new insights. And we're going to do that right now. One of the most fascinating things is that the mathematical miracle this structure of the number 19 was first published in 1974, and it just happens that Surah 74 is the chapter by which the number 19 is discussed. And Surah 74 is entitled, The Hidden Secret. And in verse 30 of Surah 74, it says, over is 19. Now, in 1974, this was discovered, and it's in Surah 74 where the number 19 is discussed. So what about the number 19? God tells us in the following verse, in 7431, it says, We appointed angels to be guardians of hell, and we assigned their number 19. One, to disturb the disbelievers. Two, to convince the Christians and Jews that this is a divine scripture. Three, to strengthen the faith of the faithful. Four, to remove all traces of doubt from the hearts of Christians, Jews, as well as the believers. And five, to expose those who harbor doubts in their hearts. And the disbelievers, they will say, What did God mean by this allegory? God thus sends astray whomever he wills and guides whomever he wills. None knows the soldiers of your Lord except he. This is a reminder for the people. Absolutely, I swear by the moon and the night as it passes, the morning as it shines. This is one of the great miracles, a warning to the human race. So let's break down this verse, 7431, where it reads, We appointed angels to be guardians of hell, and God gives us five reasons to the number 19. Now, what's fascinating is if you took 7431, 
and you count the number of words in Arabic for this verse, you get 57, which is 19 times 3. Now, the first 19 verses of Surah 74 also contain 57 words, which is 19 times 3. The number of words from the beginning of the Surah, Surah 74, to exactly where it mentions uh, the number 19 in Arabic is 95 words, which is 19 times 5. Now, the number of letters from the beginning of Surah 74 to the word 19 in 7430 is equal to 361, which is 19 times 19. So you see that this 19 miracle, again, you can zoom in and see this fascination just within this surah, within these few verses, or you can zoom out and see it on a higher level. For instance, surah 42 and 50 contain the word Q, or in Arabic, Gulf. And uh, in surah 50, verse 1, it says Q, or in Arabic, Gulf, and the glorious Quran. Now, if you count the number of times that the letter Q is mentioned in Arabic in Surah 42 and 50, each time you get 57, which is 19 times 3. Now what's interesting is you add 57 plus 57, that equals 114, which is the number of surahs in the Quran. And God uses the word majid, majid means glorious, to describe the word Quran. Now in Arabic, each letter has a corresponding value to it, kind of like a Roman numeral. So in Arabic, meme has a geometrical value of 40, Jim has a geometrical value of 3, Ya has a geometrical value of 10, Da has a geometrical value of 4. If you add those numbers, 40 plus 3 plus 10 plus 4, you get 57, which again is 19 times 3. Now what else is interesting is that this Quran is mentioned in the Quran 57 times, which is 19 times 3. If you add Surah 42 has 53 verses, so 42 plus 53 is 95, which is 19 times 5. Surah 50 has 45 verses, which is 50 plus 45 is 95 again, 19 times 5. If you count the letter Q in every 19th verse of the Quran, you get 76, which is 19 times 4. And what's fascinating about this is 42, Surah 42, actually has two sets of initials. It's Ain Sin Qof and then Ha Mi. Now, Ain Sin Qof, in addition, occurs in Surah 42 209 times, which is 19 times 11. So you're seeing this interlocking mechanism. Now, it has the second set of initials, which is Hamim. Hamim occurs in Surahs 40 through 46. And if you add all the Ha's and all the memes in these seven Surahs, the total you get is 2,147, which is 19 times 113. So you see all this complexity packed into just these two Surahs revolving around the number 19. And these are simple to understand. Again, in the surahs, you have 29 chapters that have these Quranic initials. And consistently, you'll see that these initials occur in the respective chapters in multiples of 19. Now, you take something else. The first revelation delivered to Prophet Muhammad is Surah 96, verse 1 through 5. And it reads, In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, read in the name of your Lord who created. He created man from an embryo. Read in your Lord most exalted, teaches by means of the pen. He teaches man what he never knew. These five verses, the first revelation given to Prophet Muhammad, consists of 19 words and 76 letters. 76 is 19 times 4. These letters, if you add all the letters in the entire chapter, 96, you get 285, which is 19 times 15. This chapter has 19 verses. So Surah 6 and 96 has 19 verses, and it sits on top of the last 19 surahs of the Quran, inclusive. And you just see, again, this pattern repeated, repeated over and over and over in the Quran. No matter what angle you look, how you look, you see this number 19. And these are things that are, you know, one out of every 19 numbers is going to be a multiple of 19. These are very simple to understand in intricate, beautiful kind of ways of showing that this number 19 has significance in the Quran. Even the opening statement of the Quran, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, consists of 19 letters. Now what's fascinating, apparently in Arabic, there's two ways of writing this, and it just happens that the version that's written in the Quran consists of 19, and this has been the way for 1400 years. There's another way of writing this verse where you could have 22 letters. But the way that God selected to have it into the Quran is that it has 19 letters. And it consists of four words, ism, name, Allah, uh, which is God, al-Rahman, most gracious, al-Rahim. 
the number of times that these words occur inside the Quran, and you can grab a concordance of the Quran and see this for yourself, the word ism, name, occurs 19 times. Allah occurs 2,698 times, which is 19 times 142. Al-Rahman, most gracious, occurs 114 times, which is 19 times 6. Al-Rahim, most merciful, occurs 57 times, 19 times 3. This expression, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, occurs in the Quran 114 times, despite it not occurring in one surah, which is Surah 9. So despite that, it's still, this expression occurs 114 times because in Surah 27, verse 30, when Solomon sent a letter to the Queen of Sheba, he started his letter with, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Now, what's so fascinating about this is 27 plus 30. So Surah 27 plus verse 30 gives you 57, which again is 19 times 3. And it's interesting to note that 30 is also the verse in Surah 74 where the number 19 is stated. So from Surah 9 to Surah 27, so from the missing Bismillah to where it recurs in Surah 27 verse 30, you have 19 Surahs inclusive. So you're adding Surah 9, 10, 11, all the way to 27, you have 19 Surahs. From the missing Bismillah in 2730, number of verses that state Allah occurs 513, which is 19 times 27. Even the word Allah, if you add all the verses that mention the word Allah, you get 118,123, which is a multiple of 19. The number of words from the first Bismillah of Surah 27 to the second Bismillah in 2730 is 342, which is 19 times 18. So let's keep going. I mean, we see that this pattern repeats again and again. And if you want more in uh, interest in the mathematical miracle, check out our talk in regards to introduction to the mathematical miracle, the Quran. But the Quran itself also, people knew for years that, as prior to the discovery of the mathematical miracle, that certain occurrences of words within the Quran happen in very interesting numbers. So for instance, the number of times that the word day is mentioned in the Quran is 365, which happens to be the number of days in a solar year. The number of uh, times that it says land to sea, the proportion of that is 71%, just like it is on planet Earth. And then also the number of times that Adam and Jesus is mentioned in the Quran is 25. And there's significance to this because in the Quran, in Surah 3, verse 59, God gives the example of Adam to counteract anyone who claims that Jesus is divine. In 359, it reads, the example of Jesus, as far as God is concerned, is the same as that of Adam. He created him from dust and said to him, be, and he was. Because people claim that since Jesus didn't have a father, that God was his father. God for stop for Allah. Um, but God is saying Adam didn't have a mother or father. God just said be and it is. So what's so significant about this? The fact that Adam and Jesus are both mentioned in the Quran 25 times. Surah 3 verse 59 where God makes the comparison between Adam and Jesus is both the seventh occurrence of the word Adam and the seventh occurrence of the word Jesus. The 19th occurrence of the word Adam occurs in Surah 19 verse 58. And the 19th occurrence of the word Jesus occurs in Surah 19, verse 34. So the 19th occurrence of both Adam and Jesus occurs in Surah 19. Now the difference between Surah 58 to Surah 34 inclusively is 25 verses. And in 1958, we read, These are some of the prophets whom God blessed. They were chosen from among the descendants of Adam and the descendants of those whom we carried with Noah the descendants of Abraham, Israel, and from among those whom we guided and selected, when the revelations of the most gracious are recited to them, they fall prostrate, weeping. And in Surah 1934, it reads, That was Jesus, son of Mary, and this is the truth of this matter about which they continue to doubt. So the number of verses from the 19th occurrence of the word Jesus in 1934 to the 19th occurrence of the word Adam in 1958 inclusively is 25 verses, which happens to be the number of times that both Jesus and Adam is mentioned in the Quran. Now what's interesting is in 1934, it also mentions Mary. And this also happens to be the 34th occurrence of the word Mary in Surah 19, verse 34. And if we count the number of verses from the seventh mention of Adam to the 19th mention of Adam, is 1957 verses, so 1,957, which is 19 times 103. And also, obviously, 19 is 1 times 19, 57 is 19 times 3. So even if you coupled those numbers, you would still get a multiples of 19. Now, if we add up the verses that Jesus is mentioned, the first 19 occurrences, you get the same number, 1957. 
Now, these, you can say, are just sheer coincidences. But the purpose of the mathematical miracle is to strengthen the faith of the faithful, to convince the Christians and Jews, as well as the believers, that this is a book written by the Lord of the universe to the humankind. Now, I don't expect someone who's not a believer, who has no faith, who doesn't believe in uh, God, to all of a sudden to come to the light and realize this book is written for, uh, by God. But we have the proof that we need for anyone who wants to seek the truth to realize that this is a divine scripture sent to the Christians, the Jews, the believers, anyone, everyone in the world to show them God's true message to humankind. God willing, we're going to end there. If you guys got comments, questions, please hit us up at crontalk at gmail.com. And until next time, peace and God bless.